கருணார்ணவமாய் கருத கதி நல்கும் அருணாச்சல சிவம் கீதா கருணார்ணவமாய் கருத கதி நல்கும் அருணாச்சல சிவம் கீதா Namaste and welcome to the third episode of Bhakti Bhava Uttama Bhakti part 2 So in the previous episode we were discussing the Sanskrit verse Anya bhilashita shunyam karma jnana adyana vritam anukuyena atma anushilanam bhakti rutama One must be completely devoid of other desires, one's real nature uncovered by practice of the four yogas, and constantly cultivate service favorable to the self. This is pure, unexcelled bhakti. So in the previous episode, we had gone over the intrinsic qualities of bhakti. So now let's look at the extrinsic qualities characteristics discussed in this verse anya bilashita shunya means devoid of other desires one should act only to develop bhakti giving up all aspirations in other words one should not think that karma or good activities unselfish service huh or raja cultivating detachment and seeing with insight that the ego and mind are actually illusory and jnana or self realization we should not think that these are separate from bhakti or what to speak of ordinary karma that's performed for selfish benefits Uh, that's not even on the map <laughs> if we're really engaged in bhakti we have no selfish desires at all and amazingly enough the results of karma yoga raja yoga and jnana yoga happen automatically just by performing bhakti yoga so there's no need to cultivate these other things at all there's no need to have desires for what to speak of selfish karma even karma yoga or raja yoga or jnana yoga because we get the results of all the yogas simply by cultivating bhakti not only that it's said that bhaktya sanjayataya bhaktya bhakti is produced only by bhakti in other words bhakti is not a result of anything else it's self generating self satisfying spiritual activity in relation with the self because the self is all and the self becomes everything huh yeah. therefore when we get the self we get everything we have the all because the self is all and within all so in that way there's no separate endeavor required to get all the results of the other yoga systems now we're not talking about hatha yoga exercises based on the body and we're not talking about uh kamya karma that means fruitive activities or activities performed to gain some material result we're talking only about karma yoga where one endeavors to offer everything one's body mind speech and heart to the supreme to the self or to the actual owner of everything in other words us thinking my body my mind 
my words, my feelings. Huh? This is all illusory <laughs> because there is no I to possess all these things. So really, giving all these things, offering all these things to the self is simply recognizing the reality that there is nothing other than the self. There is no owner or possessor or creator or existence other than the self. <laughs> so by offering our body, mind, speech, and feelings to the self, simply recognizing the reality. <laughs> so actually, this is Raja Yoga. See? If we completely perform Karma Yoga, we automatically engage in Raja Yoga. Because there, in Raja Yoga, we try to meditate and use insight to come to the same conclusions. So, <laughs> within bhakti are the results of all the other yogas. <laughs> and when we realize the conclusion of Raja Yoga, of course, we automatically engage in Jnana Yoga, the insight that actually everything is nothing but the self. So as soon as we accept this conclusion, as soon as we understand this, we automatically realize the self. Like Ramana says, the self is already realized. Huh? Because if I ask anyone, do you exist? Of course they're going to say, yes, I exist. That means I am aware of myself. And self-awareness is I-I. It is self-realization. So there's no need to struggle. <laughs> there's no need to make effort. It's not that the self is something external out there, different from myself, that I have to realize. Huh? It's always amusing to see or hear about people struggling and struggling and making such tremendous efforts over years and years. Huh? and dealing with all kinds of fears and anxieties about losing their egos and stuff like this. It's always kind of strange to hear this because really the self already is everything. Anything that we can see, feel, touch, or imagine. In other words, <laughs> the body, the mind, the speech, the feelings in the heart are already the self. All we have to do is realize or understand that or assert it. And that's it. That's the end of the path. That's it, guys. There is nothing more. And from that point on, the only thing to do is love it. Isn't it? One loves oneself more than anything else. When one realizes that oneself is everything, huh? because everything is derived from consciousness. Is there anything that we can see, feel, touch, think, or feel in relation with huh, that is not part of consciousness? Of course not. If we're not conscious of it, it doesn't exist as far as we're concerned. So, anything that we see, hear about, smell, taste, touch, or think about is within our consciousness. And our consciousness is the self. Self-awareness, Brahman. So, simply by practicing bhakti, cultivating this self-awareness and offering everything to the self, we can practically realize this. And so then what is there to do after realization? Nothing but bhakti, ananya bhakti. Realization that the self is everything, so I can love everything unrestrictedly. <laughs> this is real bhakti, pure bhakti. And it's actually only possible for a realized being to practice it purely. 
So the other thing is that the natural condition for a sadhaka is to have no desires other than for bhakti. Because what else is there? Only the self. And we love the self, don't we? <laughs> Doesn't everybody love their self? So really there are no desires other than for bhakti. Unless one sees oneself as a separate being and then all desires are separate from bhakti and they're all offensive to bhakti. So in other words, a person who is not self-realized, who sees the body, mind, and ego as separate from God or from this, the world, as a separate thing, an individual, uh, cannot practice bhakti, even though they may try externally to do puja and so many other things that uh, are supposed to spark bhakti. Their bhakti will always be impure. The only one who can actually practice pure bhakti is one who is self-realized. Another extrinsic characteristic, or tatashtra lakshana, is discussed in this verse as karma jnana dhyanavritam. One's real nature is uncovered by practice of the yogas, karma, bhakti, raja, and jnana. Because we are not this body. We are not this mind. We are not this ego. We are only the self. And these yogas remind us of it. So if we're not self-realized, we have to practice all these yogas separately to gain their particular insights. But once we are self-realized, then the only thing to do is to practice bhakti, pure bhakti, because our real nature is only the self. Now, another point is the perfection of bhakti includes the results of the other yoga systems, karma, raja, and jnana. For example, successful cultivation of bhakti depends on a background in karma yoga. One must be willing to offer everything to God or the self, depending on whether we're seeing dualistically or non-dualistically. <laughs> karma yoga means I give my body, my mind, my ego, my thoughts, my feelings, any of my possessions, huh? I offer them all to the self, or I engage them all in the service of the self. For example, I look around the room here. Everything I have, everything that is under my supervision or management, is engaged somehow or other in the production of these podcasts. Uh, there isn't anything <laughs> that I can see in the room that is unrelated to my service as sharing these truths about pure bhakti. So in other words, I have offered everything, my body, my mind, my senses, my possessions, my money, everything is fully engaged in this service. But that's karma yoga. But because my ultimate aim is to perform bhakti to the self, then they are also means to practice of bhakti. So bhakti automatically leads to raja yoga and jnana yoga. How is that? Because if everything I have, everything I do, and everything I am, is engaged in the service of the self. That means at all times and in all circumstances, all of my actions, all of my feelings and thoughts are engaged or related to the self in a positive, favorable way. So that is automatically Raja Yoga. 
There is no ego. There is no separate individual. I am only the self. And all of so-called my possessions are engaged in the self. So that's the conclusion of jnana also. So in other words, by practice of pure ananya bhakti, I get the results of all the other yoga systems. Now, there are three types of bhakti. Aropasiddha means activities and emotions which, though not pure bhakti, are designated as bhakti due to being offered to the Supreme. For example, let's take a person who's just a beginner on the path. Uh, and maybe they are engaged in family life and business activities, but every so often they go to the temple and they offer some part of their income or possessions, or they offer some service activities in the temple. And so in this way, they're offering things and those things which are offered, even though they are products of mundane work, in other words, kamya karma, because they are offered to the Supreme, directly or indirectly, they become bhakti, aropa siddha bhakti. Okay? They, are, they become bhakti, or they become spiritualized by designation. This is no longer my money. Now I have given it to the temple. It becomes God's money. You see? So simply by shifting the designation of those funds, it becomes bhakti. It becomes an offering. So this is bhakti by designation. Uh, the next kind is Sangha Siddha Bhakti, activities and emotions associated with or favorable to the development of bhakti, but not themselves pure bhakti. For example, learning the scriptures, accepting a guru, giving up things and actions and feelings which are unfavorable to bhakti giving up bad association, and so on. We'll have more examples a little bit later. These things are not directly bhakti, but they are favorable for the development of bhakti. They are associated with bhakti. We see that people who do these things also become advanced or developed in bhakti. So by association, by sangha, they become uh, considered as bhakti. And finally, sarupa siddha bhakti, activities and emotions of pure uttama bhakti. So we'll discuss and describe all these things in great detail in subsequent episodes of this series. But the important thing to know right now is that the siddha, huh, aropa siddha, sangha siddha, and Swarupa Siddha are all considered perfected or liberated by means of their relationship with bhakti, even if it's only by designation or by association, aropa or sangha. See, that's the amazing thing about bhakti. It can transfer its potency simply by designation so one can be liberated even in family life, even in business, uh, or even in ordinary religion, simply by offering these activities or associating these activities with pure bhakti. And in practice, what does that mean? It means being uh, supportive or associated with one's guru who is a pure, realized being. So finally, why should we aim for uttama bhakti rather than mixed bhakti, huh? aropa siddha bhakti and uh, sangha siddha bhakti are both mixed bhakti. They're not simply pure bhakti without any other support. 
Well, Uttama Bhakti gives spontaneous loving ecstasy, Vyabhichari Bhava, which is reciprocation from the self. Huh? In other words, we don't do anything to try to experience these ecstatic emotions. They simply happen as a result of pure bhakti. They are not the result of mixed bhakti. So if one gets these symptoms, one can know, actually, I'm engaged in pure bhakti. They are the indicator. They are the symptom of pure bhakti. They are the result of pure bhakti alone. Mixed bhakti will not give vyabhachari bhavas. Uttama bhakti is, therefore, the ocean of complete bliss. Anyone engaged in it is always experiencing ecstatic symptoms, although they may be covered huh, if one is a deep bhakta. Where if one is a shallow bhakta, one is going to be bouncing off the walls with bliss. <laughs> Uttama bhakti is without any offenses. If one is engaged in uttama bhakti, one is not offensive or harmful to any other beings. This is very important because we see people engaged in mixed bhakti are often offensive. In other words, they're sometimes performing activities which have no relation with the self, or they have uh, emotions which have no relation with the self, or they condemn others. Huh? They have negative attitudes and emotions toward some part of the self, because actually everyone and everything is the self. Uttama Bhakti gives complete enlightenment when it matures into Raja and Jnana Yoga. So in other words, we don't have to practice Raja and Jnana Yoga separately to get their benefits. All we have to do is cultivate pure bhakti, uttama bhakti. And finally, uttama bhakti leads to full surrender to the self, nirvikalpa and savikalpa samadhi. Now, these are very exalted states, and yet, for one engaged in uttama bhakti, they happen spontaneously as a natural result of their pure devotion to the self. Om Tatsa. Om Harihi Om. Karunar Navamai Kardakadinalgum Aruna Chalashivam Yidam